Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. We're big, we're bad, we're back. I'm in black with another Fact Friday. So we're here at Nick Salden's studios, a La Barca sound in lovely, yes, Balls Cross. Yep, that's the name of the village, Balls Cross. <laughs> Couldn't get more English than that. So we have a bunch of rather wonderful frequently asked questions, which we have garnered from different levels of social media here on YouTube, but also on TikTok, because we get a lot of questions there. If you haven't checked out our TikTok channel, please do. I'm sure somebody will put a link down below for you to click on, if you're a TikToker, that is. All right, our first question is this. What is automation? The best answer is automation is what takes your mix over the edge. Boom, done. A lot of people these days, and I understand, mix in a very linear way. They make everything as loud as possible, in your face, beginning to end of a track. Great, you know, hit them over the head, smack it when they come in, get louder, get more compressed, more limited, more clipped, and off you go. And maybe, frankly, in some genres that works really well, maybe in EDM and metal or anything else that's a full frontal assault, that's great. However, automation for me, like I said at the beginning, takes your mix to the next level. It's fun things, for instance, like panning stuff around so it keeps people's interest. So it isn't just stationary left and right and center stuff, but maybe that stuff moving. Pair of headphones on, what a beautiful experience to hear things panning around. Whether it be dramatically or just moving slightly, that's wonderful. The next thing that's really great, of course, is volume automation. Bringing up and featuring certain instruments, especially, say, a bass line where it's like playing eighths and then suddenly goes do 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 You might want to bring up that bass line for 2 dB between the vocal so that your ear grabs it. Drum fills, maybe turning up the toms in a big section, maybe pushing up room mics so you get the illusion that the drums are even bigger still. A trick that many of us do is to use the rooms really dramatically where there's a break for a drum fill. And then you get the illusion that those room mics are actually there the whole time. So that's where automation wins. And probably equally as important is making sure that things are heard consistently when they need to be heard. Like one of the things that I will automate more than anything else is, of course, a vocal. You want that vocal to be there and be ever present. I always think of a vocal that has to be like a ball of energy sitting in the middle of the mix. I love to be able to feel like I can pick it up in the middle. And if it's done really, really well, whatever phrase you have will always feel like it's in that place. And I think that's super, super important to be able to automate the ends of phrases in particular, where a singer maybe is breathing through a note like, I don't, and that don't, getting the end of that phrase and just pushing it up will give you so much more impression of passion and charisma in a vocal. So automation is super, super important. What do you think of subwoofers? Well, this is a good one because we just did a subwoofer test here at La Barca. So we have found that a subwoofer is a rather wonderful attribute. I said to Nick that I felt like it was on the border of good and essential. You know, is it essential? Maybe not. But is it a really good thing to have? Absolutely. Especially if you're doing modern music with extended low end, which frankly is pretty much everything these days. Listen to a modern country song, it has a massive extended low end. It is everywhere now. It's not the 70s. We've got 30 and 40 hertz in pretty much everything that you listen to now. Should I listen in solo? I have answered this in different ways before because the only mixer I've ever sat with and believed when they said they don't solo is Bob Clearmountain. I've been in a room with pretty much every other mixer on the planet, the well-known ones, with a couple of exceptions, and they've all soloed. And I understand why. You make an adjustment, you've got something that's bothering you, and you want to find out what it is that's bothering you, and so you solo it and see if you can find out maybe what instrument has that sound. But with Bob Clearmountain, he told me he doesn't solo, and I completely believe it. What I found was listening to his mixes, which I still think are the finest in the world, I don't hear any problems in it. But if I soloed something, I might find a problem on the instrument in solo. But that's not important at all. 
Nobody is going to be driving down the motorway, driving down the freeway, listening to your mix going, I wonder what it sounds like if I solo the vocal. <laughs> it just doesn't work like that. So what do I think? I think if you are an accomplished Bob Clear Mountain level person and you can mix without having to solo, God bless you. You're one in a million. But the rest of us use solo specifically to find out where you're hearing a problem. Don't obsess on it. Do not spend hours listening into solo, making it the greatest vocal sound ever that when you put it in a track suddenly isn't bright enough. That's what will happen. If you listen to a vocal perfectly, you'll take out every single little frequency and make it all beautiful and soft and perfect and lovely and put it back into your mix and realize it no longer cuts through and that you took out some of the energy in the vocal that needs to be there to cut through all of the other instruments. So the best advice I can give is work in both. Listen to your mix. If there's a problem and you're not sure where it is, use solo to identify it. Think there's some extra wispiness. What's it on? Is it on the hi-hat? Is it on the vocal? Is it on this or is it on that? Yes, definitely identify the problem and use it as a tool, but do not obsess in solo and make things sound so perfect in solo that they don't work in your final mix. Why do people use Yamaha NS10s? Speaking as a guy, God, this is Two Bob Clear Mountain shout outs. Because of Bob Clear Mountain. There you go. End of question. No, it is. If you go back to the 80s and you read any interviews with Bob Clear Mountain, he talked about wanting to use hi fi speakers so that he had an idea of how people were listening to the music that he was creating, that he was mixing. So he bought a pair of Yamaha NS10s, which were hi fi speakers. Those of us that have used them, and that was me growing up will tell you they were very, very harsh speakers. To the best of my memory, they have a 7 dB lift at about 1.5K. They are so mid-rangey and aggressive that they're very, very fatiguing to listen to. However, we got used to them, and we learned that if snare drums were really loud and cracking, and guitars were horribly offensive and loud and angular, then our mixes sounded good. It's a little bit like the Tannoy Little Golds, my good friend Dave Jordan mixed hundreds of albums on those and said if there was a certain kind of distortion in the low end, he knew the kick drum was perfect. It's a weird thing to talk about in our modern age where modern speakers are cheaper and flatter than the speakers that we grew up using before, and now you can trust them better. But in those days when NS10s were out, you mixed to make them sound a certain way. And that's a very, very strange thing to sort of talk about now with the way people are developing speakers. But that's what it was like. It was a case of mid-range detail. I'd hear a lot of people say that, oh, the aggressive mid-range makes it easier for me to mix the high end. But these days, is that a valid point of view? I don't know. To be honest, I think that if you're starting out, why would you buy a pair of NS10s? Why do you need to put yourself through that learning process of listening to music so differently? Because a pair of NS10s, God love them, sound nothing like a phone, headphones, your car, nothing sounds like them anymore. Where when I was a kid, everything was horrible, honky, mid-range. You get into a car and it was like, nah, 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 nah. you know, AM radios, even FM radios, cassettes with horrible Walkman headphones, all were mid-rangey, disgusting, honky things. And maybe NS10s in those days had a place. These days, the quality of even the most average things is so much better. The fact that you can get a pair of studio monitors now for sort of $300, $350 a pair, which sound flatter than anything else, is a completely different world. So my advice is, if you're asking that question because you think you're missing out, you're not. If you're starting out, buy some flatter sounding speakers and learn on those. Nothing against anybody that grew up listening to NS10s, I did. Nothing against anybody who knows how to mix really well on NS10s. God bless you, it's absolutely wonderful. But if you're starting out, I honestly would not recommend buying them. It's just my opinion. Is GarageBand a good DAW? Yeah, because it's bleeding easy to use. It comes free with any Apple Mac kind of product. I have done demos on it quicker and easier than any other DAW I own. You know, I always used to be a bit, a bit confused with, with Pro Tools back in the early days when I wanted to create a MIDI track or an instrument track, and I was like, what's the difference? And obviously I learned, but GarageBand is so 
bleeding intuitive. It is ridiculously intuitive. You just kind of select what you want it to be, the instrument you're going to record, and off you go. I've done demos on GarageBand that I've ended up using the internal sound card, exported the tracks, put it into Pro Tools, and carried on tracking on it. It's really, really easy to use, and it comes free with any Apple product, I believe. And if it doesn't, it should. No, I think it comes free. It's cheap, easy, dumb as a box of nails. And me. Anyway, hope you're all doing marvelously well. Thanks ever so much for watching. Uh, it's been great to do another Frequently Asked Questions Friday, another Fact Friday. We'll be back with another one next week. So long, farewell, Alvida Zayan, au revoir, adios, goodbye.